five minutes in a, so really, y'all are looking good. I haven't been up here in a, in a little bit. Y'all still looking good, like so good. Just turn to the person next to you and say, man, so good. Just say it once because it gets creepy if you say it more than once. Um, Robert, I'll say it more than once, man. You look good. So, so glad you are here. Um, I'm glad to be with you guys. We are kicking off a brand new series today called The Greatest Story of Soul. And so, uh, if you are new here, today's your first Sunday here, or if you're back after a while, you picked a great time to be here because uh, you're coming in right at the beginning of the story. And so, um, and this series is going to lead us all the way into Easter, which is in just a few weeks, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's here. And so, uh, we just saw the announcement, but just to encourage you guys, like, and you're going to hear this a lot from us over the next few weeks, that we would love for you to invite people. Uh, and, and let me just tell you why, okay? It's not, I mean, we love having people in this community. We love doing life together. We love a full room. But what I really love is people knowing Jesus. Like, like honestly, like when I think, I was processing this week, like Jesus has changed my life. And when I look out here in the room, I see so many stories of lives that Jesus has changed, right? And so I'll do whatever we have to do that more people get to experience that. And what we've discovered is that Christmas and Easter are the Sundays that people are more open than any other time of year. And so you never know what hangs on the other side of an invitation. So would you invite somebody? Think about it now. Hey, even start calling them. Text them today so they have no other plans, right? Don't be that last minute like, oh, if you would have texted me last week, no, just do it today, right? Um, and then let's see what God wants to do with the invitation, all right? So that's Easter, Saturday night, and then two on Sunday. It's going to be great. But All right. So like I said, we are kicking off our series, The Greatest Story Ever Told. And we were talking this week about that title, and Keith's like, hey, it better be good. <laughs> right? Like, that's a big title. And I was like, I agree. But the thing is, that's true for all of us, is that everyone loves a good story. Right? Everybody loves a good story. Like, stories engage us. Stories connect us, you know, like when we hear a good story, like it's like, I mean, we're part of something bigger than ourselves, right? You know, I was reading this week, uh, there were some neuroscientists, which is kind of a part-time hobby of mine, you know? And so, uh, <laughs> I just do it for a hobby because I love it. And so, but they did this study, right? And so, that whenever there is a, a, a well-told story happening, right? So they did an MRI on a storyteller and someone listening to a well-told story. And as they told the story and as they listened to the story, the same parts of their brain lit up in the MRI. Which means that when you listen to a well-told story, that you put yourself in that story. You become a part of it, right? So I'm hoping that your brains light up in the next few minutes, right? <laughs> but which is interesting knowing this, is that people that, that when you hear the story, you put, your place, you put yourself in that place, is that when we look at the Gospels, Jesus told stories all the time. And Jesus was like a master storyteller. This guy just, I mean, he could show up and tell a story, and it was just incredible, right? And so uh, he would tell these stories and engage with people, and he would tell stories and meet them right where they were. And this was cool. Sometimes he'd be telling a story to people, and about halfway through, they were like, wait, that's, your, that's my story. Like, you, you're like, he knew stuff about people, and so he would start telling the details of their lives, and it was kind of freaking them out a little bit, right? but it impacted them. Other times he would tell stories about the goodness of God, about how God viewed us, you know, about the kingdom of heaven. And when he told stories, though, is that he would come and he would connect with us. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of these stories. My time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. This series will continue next week. Um, I said, just ring the bell when I'm getting too good. That's uh. <laughs> So, in this series, we're going to look at some stories, right? We're going to look at some stories that Jesus told, that it was telling their story and our story. In some of these weeks, we're going to look at some interactions where Jesus connected with people, and he told stories about what God was like, and that story changed our story. Because there's one thing that we all have in common. I don't know you, I don't know all your details, but one thing that everyone in this room, all of you who are watching online, is that we all have a story, right? Right? And some of your stories, it is a, it's a story. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
it is, I mean, you know who you are, right? Everybody knows who you are. So it's um, <laughs> one of the coolest things that I get to do is I get to meet with people, and I get to hear stories, and I love it. Like, I really love hearing people's stories. And so I meet with people sometimes, and I hear parts of their stories, and I'm like, y'all, there's no way this is true. Like, and then they show me the social media post. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I definitely would not put that online anywhere, right? <laughs> and so you have a story. And some of you have a, like, a, your story is more normal, whatever that means. It's just kind of like, it's just kind of you play through life, and it just kind of happened, right? But one thing, whether it's a crazy or normal story, our stories are told from our perspective. Like when you tell me your story, it's from your perspective, right? And so I want to challenge us today and over throughout this series that what if, there, what if there's another way to look at your story? You know, you've been telling your story your whole life. You've been sharing the same details, the same experiences, the same feelings and emotions. But what if there's a different way to tell your story? What, what if Jesus is wanting to rewrite your story? The good stuff, the bad stuff. What is Jesus saying? Hey, let's just rewrite some of your story and let's see what happens. So this morning, we're going to look at one of Jesus' most well-known stories, uh, one of his parables. And so some of you, uh, when you hear this, you're going to be like, yep, I've heard it before, Jake. That's all you got, you know? Uh, some of you, if, and, and honestly, if you're hearing this, this story for the first time, you have an advantage, right? Because when stories become too familiar, they lose some power in our lives. Anybody recognize that, right? Like when you're like, when you start to fill in the blanks even before the story's told, you're like, yeah, I've heard it before. But I always try to put myself in the position of this first century audience. They're hearing this stuff for the first time. So if you're hearing this stuff for the first time, man, I'm so excited, right? Because it becomes real in our lives. And the story we're going to look at today, um, each of our stories is in this story, okay? So your story, no matter what your story is, is in this story. And, but just to challenge you, okay, that when I hear a good story, I like to place myself in the story. If I'm honest, I used to place myself in the place of the hero. <laughs> Anybody with me? Like you're the one that saves the day, right? You're the one that has all the answers. You're the one that comes through. You're the one that, that fixes stuff. And so let me just, so we're all on the same playing field. I'm not the hero, and you're not the hero. Everybody just say, I'm not the hero. I like to think I'm the hero, but I'm not the hero, right? And so, but I would encourage you as we look through this story today that you would ask yourself, man, where am I in this story? Who am I in this story? And Jesus, what do you want to say to me about my own story? Um, and so we're going to pray, and we're going to jump in. So Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you that you, even that you told stories to connect, that you love us, you care for us. So Father, I pray that even as we look at this story this morning, that we would know and remember that you're not that far away, that you are with us, you are for us, and that you're always looking for opportunities to rewrite our story. So we just kind of open our hands and our hearts to you today and say whatever you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So... We're going to find this story in the book of Luke, and, and what that means is that Luke which was one of Jesus' disciples, and he's the one who kind of documented this interaction, right? And so he kind of starts the story saying that there were these tax collectors and these sinners that would gather around Jesus, okay? And if you know about tax collectors, they were like the bottom of the barrel. They were terrible people. Um, Romans didn't like them because uh, they were pretty much their servants, and they were stealing money from their people for them. Their own people didn't like them because they were thieves. And so throughout Scripture, it talks about tax collectors being pretty terrible and awful, right? And so much so, it connects tax collectors with notorious sinners, people like y'all. And so this is, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, some of y'all. <laughs> but here's the thing. Now, think about, like, if you made it to Scripture, you're like, hey, I'm in this book. My friend wrote about me in this book. They're like, where, what's he say? He says, I'm a notorious sinner, right? Like, you're like, man, that's all the credits I get. But the notorious sinners, these were people who were on the outside. They were on the outside because of maybe what, who their family was, maybe of what they had done. And being outside meaning that you couldn't go to the temple, you couldn't worship in the temple, you couldn't really interact 
or engage with God the way that you were supposed to. And so they were viewed, uh, especially by the Pharisees, as outside of God's ability to bless. So imagine that's what they called you. That when people saw you, they said, man, they're a notorious sinner. God came and blessed them. They're on the outside. And you live your whole life feeling that way. And maybe some of you have lived your whole life feeling that way. And the really cool thing is that Jesus says, hey, I'm going to tell a different story. And so, but here's, here's the cool thing with that. I almost missed that, is that you have the worst of the worst. The worst of the worst. Think about our culture, our society, the world. You think about the worst people that you want to group as the worst. And the worst of the worst come and listen to the best of the best. Y'all, this does not make sense in my mind, right? Because those who were nothing like Jesus, they really liked Jesus. There, there was something different about this guy that those who were nothing like him, they liked him, so they would gather around him. So Jesus starts to tell a story. He said, all right, imagine a farmer, a shepherd, you're right? He had 100 sheep, and he lost one. He still had 99, but he left those 99 to go find the one. He finds the one. He's so excited. He calls his friend. He says, hey, we're going to have a party because I found the one sheep. And they're like, okay, that's a cool story. He said, imagine a woman, which Jesus is telling stories about women. I mean, it's pretty awesome too, right? He says, imagine a woman who had 10 coins and she lost one. And even through some study, they said the floors of these houses they lived in had stones or bricks with cracks, right? And so through digs that they've done, they would find coins stuck in the crack of the floor. And so he said, she has 10 coins, she loses one, she tears the entire house up to find the one coin. And when she finds it, she calls all of her friends and says, hey, we're going to celebrate. And they're like, okay, that's cool, right? And so he just keeps going. There was a man, he had two sons. He had a younger son and an older son. The younger son comes to his father one day and says, hey, I want my share of my inheritance. This is what he really said. He said, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So the father agreed to give him his share. Can we just stop for a second? <laughs> that idea, and our culture is not really even built on inheritance. It's not really built as much as this culture was, right? But in essence, this young son went to his father and said, hey, dad, I've been waiting for you to die. <laughs> and you're not dead yet. Kind of cramping my style a little bit. And I've been waiting patiently, and you're not dead, so can we just pretend like you are dead and go ahead and give me what I have coming? And if you said that to your father and said, hey, go ahead and give me what I have coming, it would not be a pretty picture, right? Like... <laughs> One of us is going to be dead, right? <laughs> and honestly, my whole life I read this that it was more about material things. You know, he wants his share. He wants his half. But really what the younger son is saying is that our relationship is over. From now on, I'm going to treat you like you're not even here. And I'm going to go, I'm going to take my, your stuff, and I'm going to go away, and I don't want to relate with you anymore. Think about the insult that, that is. And so the people in this first century audience, they're hearing this. Think about what, they're in shock. They're like, they should kill him right there. And they'd be in their right, right? And so then the father says, okay, I'll give you your half. And he takes his half. He packs up his stuff. A few days later, he goes and he moves to a distant land. Because when you want to do things that you shouldn't be doing, you go to a distant land, Right? You don't do those things in your hometown because somebody's going to find out. Somebody's going to see you. He goes to a distant land. He wastes all his money in wild living. And then about the time the money ran out, a famine hit. And he begins to starve. You ever been in a situation that goes from bad to worse? You know, like, man, just when you think, you're like, things could not get any worse. And then a famine hits. And the reason this happens, especially when we make these choices that put us in bad situations, is because sin has consequences. 
When you're doing things you shouldn't be doing or you know that, man, that is not setting you up for God's best in your life, there are consequences that come from that. And so things can go from bad to, to, to worse really quickly, right? And so the audience is hearing that and like, well, it serves him right. Let him starve. So then this young, the young son, he finds a farmer and says, hey, will you hire me? He says, yes, go feed my pigs, which was like the lowest of the low. So much so he was hungry, he was starving, and the, there was these carob pods that they would feed pigs. It's like the lowest, it's like trash. He's looking at these pods and says, man, it starts to, it's starting to look good. And then he realized, I'm out of my mind. And he comes to his senses, and he says, even the servants, in my, in my father's house, even the servants have more than enough. He said, I'm out here dying of hunger. He says, I will go home to my father, and this is what I'm going to say. Father, I've sinned against you in heaven, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please just take me on as a hired servant. So he begins to rehearse his story, right? This is a story where he's pretty sure that he's no longer able to be called a son, maybe a servant, maybe just on the fringe, right? So it says he packs up his stuff and he returns home to his father. While he was still a long way off, the father sees him. This part of the story is just incredible. The father sees him and he starts, he runs out to him. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, he embraced him, he kissed him. He said to his son, Father, the son, I'm sorry, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. That's, that's pretty heavy words, right? I realize what I've done. And I feel bad. I realize how far I've messed up. I realize what I did to our relationship. I realize that when I made those choices, what it did to you, and I'm sorry, and I can't even come back into the family, but will you just hire me as a servant? And the father stops him. He stops him and he says, hey, hey, servants, quick, go get the robe, go get the ring, go get sandals and bring them to my son. They said, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and then go kill the calf that we've been fattening because we must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost and now he is found and the party begins. You see, this son was telling the story the whole time. And the father's like, actually, I'm going to tell a different story. I'm going to tell a different story. So while the father is telling a different story with the younger son, the older brother, remember him? He's out in the field working. That's where older brothers should be. I'm the baby. Older brother should be in the field working, <laughs> right? And, and so he goes, he's in the field, and he, he's returning to the house, and he hears music and dancing. And he says, hey, what's going on to this servant? And the servant says, well, older brother, you remember, you remember your little brother? You remember him, the one that left with half of your stuff? Well, he came back. Here he is. And you remember, you remember that robe that you liked? That you've been like kind of eyeing up a little bit? You try on sometimes when your dad wasn't around? Your dad just gave it to him. Yeah. You remember that ring, that family ring that says that you're the son that you've been waiting for, that you think maybe one day, you're not, you're, you've been patient, one day you'll get the ring. Well, your dad just made me go put it on, on your brother's finger. And those nice sandals, you know what I'm saying? Those, he's wearing them. <laughs> and then that calf, you know that calf that you've been feeding every day? You had to get up every day and, and carry that bucket of food out to feed that calf that you thought one day we'd have a party. Well, guess what? <laughs> Today's the day. And so they had this party, and this, the older brother, he becomes angry, and he wouldn't go in. He wouldn't go in. The dad gets word. He goes out to him, and this is what the older brother says. Uh, the dad's begging him, please come in. And the brother says, all these years... I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. In all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. I've been slaving for you. 
And all this time, you never even gave me a goat. And then, this is, don't, don't miss this line, verse 30. It says, yet when this son of yours comes back from wasting all his money on wild living, he wouldn't even call his brother by his name. You, you have anybody in your life that you won't even call by their name? Like maybe, like maybe that ex? Oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, like when you tell the story, you're like, oh yeah, his mom or her mom. I know y'all don't do this stuff, but other people do this stuff, you know? <laughs> but you won't even place enough value on the other person because of something in your heart towards them. And so you say, those people. And when we say those people, it usually indicates that I'm right and they're wrong. I'm just saying, this isn't the scripture. It's not even my idea, right? This is... <laughs> Can I just tell you something that might burst your bubble a little bit? Is that you are probably those people to someone else? What? <laughs> hey, this is good preaching, Jake. I'm just saying. <laughs> that possibly when someone talks about you, they're saying those people. Because they think they're doing it right and that you're doing it wrong. What? We don't like to think that, right? Because we like to think that we're doing it right. This older brother says, I did everything right. And then this son of yours is your fault. It's not me. This is what the father said. He said, look, my son, you have always stayed with me. And everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Not yet. I did this to you last time. <laughs> Sorry. I do this all the time. He said, I can't follow what you're saying. I'm like, I can't follow what I'm saying either, bro. I'll holler at you in just a second. <laughs> I did my boy wrong last time. I had him come all the way up and made him go sit down. So sorry. <laughs> Here, I'm going to do better. So here's the thing. Uh, the father says, dear son, listen. Listen, everything I have is yours. And you've been with me. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, and now he's found. And that's the end of the story, right? Jesus never tells us what happens. And the reason I wanted to tell this story today because there are so many stories being told in this story. There's so many stories, right? You have the younger brother's story, and it's his version of the story. And as he heads home, he, he's, he's full of shame. He's wasted all the money. He rehearses this speech about his father, saying, Hey, Dad, I'm pretty sure I can't be your son anymore. I know what I've done. I've done a lot. I've gone too far. I wanted to go even further away, but I ran out of money. And I can't be your son, but at least would you let me be your servant? And so he's telling this story, right? And that's his story that he's kind of lived in. That's the story that he's been believing. And maybe, maybe you've believed that kind of story also, that you feel like you've done too much. Because you know what you've done, or you know what you've wanted to do. And you've kind of had to, you've placed yourself on the outside of God's ability to bless. And so you've lived in this story. But what's stunning is that when the father sees him, he demands that the best robe be placed on him, the, the ring placed on his finger and sandals on his feet. Because listen, because robes and rings and sandals, they are signs of being a son. And the father says, actually, I'm telling a different story. Because the father, he looks at his son, the son who is convinced that he's on the outside, the son that he is convinced that he's done too much. And the father says, actually, I'm telling a different story. And my story is about redemption. My story is about forgiveness. My story is about those who are on the outside. Now they're in with me. And he looks at this son who is, who is by all accounts, messed up way beyond what was right. And the father looks at him and says, you're my son. Put my robe on, wear my ring. You put my shoes on your feet. 
and you're my son. It's a different version of the story. Years ago, I was, um, don't judge me, so I, pick, I pick up hitchhikers all the time. So, uh, I don't know why I just do it. But anyway, I'm driving here in town. There's an older gentleman walking. It's hot, so I pick him up. And I always ask him, I'm like, hey, tell me your story. I, at first, I tell him, you don't kill me. I won't kill you. Okay? <laughs> and then I ask him their story. And so this guy starts telling me a story. He had spent his whole life uh, not knowing his father. He said, but I wanted to know my father. He said, but I just wasn't sure if I ever found him how he would feel about me. He said he was older, he's in town, he meets someone, and they're like, hey, you're so-and-so. I know your father. Your father would like to meet you. He said he shows up. They have this time, and his father, who now is older, he runs to his son, and he grabs him and says, I've been looking for you your whole life. And this old man who's been looking for his son his whole life, he throws a party I mean, it's the, it's the gospel in my truck, right? This is why you should pick up hitchhikers. This is what... <laughs> See, the son had been living in a different story, not sure. And the father says, actually, my story, you're still my son. And my story, man, everything I have is yours. Come on home, right? And so the younger son has to decide which story he's going to believe. Is he going to continue believing the story that says he's on the outside, that says he's done too much, that says, man, he has messed up, he's too far gone? Or is he going to believe his father's story that says you're my son, no matter what you've done? What story do you believe? When you think about your life, what story do you believe? But there's also the, old, the older brother, right? And he has his own story. Because his older brother is pretty sure that he's done everything right. He played by the rules, right? He he didn't leave. He showed up. He never complained. And he looks like he's done everything right on the outside, except there's something going on with his heart, right? Because when he speaks about his father, he's like, I was a slave for you. And he questions his father's generosity and his goodness and the fairness of this thing. And in one sentence, the father changes the older son's story as well. Listen, he says, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. Listen, if you've been here, maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time, you feel like you've, you've done all the right things and didn't go do the things you really wanted to do. Jesus is saying, hey, you've been with me the whole time, but listen, You're not a slave. You're not slaving for me. You're not trying to earn what you have. Listen to me. Hey, listen. You're not here trying to earn anything. The Father's saying, actually, everything I have is yours. Stay or go, whatever, everything I have is yours. Receive it. You're my son. You're my son. See, when we think that we have to earn or that we, when we think that we are earning God's favor, it makes us the hero. You know what I'm saying? Like somehow, like, yeah, you know, I'm a pastor. <laughs> For real. That's why you see people in ministry that, man, if you're not really careful, or maybe when you look at your life, you're like, I'm not as bad as I used to be. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't do that. And we become the hero of our story. And actually, Jesus is saying, actually, you can try, but you don't fit that very well. This is what Paul Tripp says about uh, this. Paul Tripp says, thinking that the grace that you once needed is no longer essential is a recipe for disaster. See, when we're young, when we're dumb, when we're doing stupid things, we're like, oh, I need lots of grace, right? And then we think that we arrive because we look different than we used to look and we do things differently than we used to do. 
but we never become our own hero. It's still the father saying, I'm rewriting your story, and you're my son, and I'm your father. And it's nothing you can do or don't do that changes his story, right? So my question is, who are you in this story? Are you the younger son who feels like you've done too much and you're on the outside and you know, even though on the outside you try to hold it together, but you're like, man, I'm a mess. And I'm pretty sure I'm beyond God's ability to, to bless me and to even love me. Or, or maybe you're like the older son and you think, I've done a lot. And I'm kind of on my own because I'm, I'm having to maintain this thing because, man, I, I play by the rules. I got to hold it together. So who are you in this story? But then whose story are you going to believe? Are you going to believe your story or your heavenly father's? And I feel like we're invited into the greatest story ever told that says you're not the hero, but I have enough grace and mercy and kindness and love to meet you right in your story. Wherever you are in your story, I'll meet you there. And I'm inviting you into a bigger story. And then we have to be children that say, okay, Father, whatever you say, here I am. It's not about me. Because we remember that in this greatest story ever told, it's the story of love. It's the story of kindness. It's where our stories become new and rewritten. And we're invited into it. So I want to encourage you today that you would ask yourself, where are you in the story? Where are you wanting to be in the story? What do you need to do to get there? And over these next few weeks, let's explore, let's dive deeper and see what Jesus is saying to us about each of our stories. So let's pray. Father, thank you. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for second chances and third and fourth and fifth chances, God. Thank you that you can humble us when we need humility in our lives. But God, most importantly, thank you that you meet us right where we are. So Father, I'm praying today that as we go this week, that anywhere we've been believing the wrong story, God, where we think maybe we're on the outside or we think that it's all about us, God, would you um, help us correct? And God, would our hearts turn back to you, our Father? Because remembering that we'd remember that we have nothing good in our lives apart from you. So, hey, if you're here today and you've never really even given your life to Jesus and you feel like you hear this stuff and you feel like the younger son who's been out kind of doing your own thing, doing your own way, and you feel like often it goes from bad to worse. You know, Jesus never says, hey, if you follow me, you won't have problems. But what he does say, if you follow me, I'll be with you. And so I want to encourage you today that, I mean, right where you are, that you would even say the prayer saying, Jesus, I want you to lead my life. I want to follow you. Realizing that we aren't great leaders of our own lives, that we need a Savior. We need a Heavenly Father. So if that's you, God can hear your thoughts. He, can, he, can, he knows the prayer of your heart. And it could be between you and God right there. Or if you're here and you're like, I've been trying to do this on my own. God, would you soften my heart again? Have that prayer as well. Father, would you soften my heart? Make me like you. Jesus, thank you. You meet us right where we are. And that you change our story. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Jake, you were right. That was some good preaching. Yeah. I feel like we need to put a little disclaimer, though. The official stance of New Hope is not to pick up hitch. No, sorry. That's, just, that's, that's, that's the cop in me that's, uh, whew, yeah. Uh, no, I love that he does that. We get so many amazing stories and stuff that comes out of that. But, yeah, I so love the way that Jesus told these stories and all these different stories are going to be doing in this series and how, how Jesus would uh, leave it open-ended and kind of leave those, you know, leave room for us in the story to where we can put ourselves in there and how every time we, we hear these things in different seasons of our life, it means something different. I got something totally different out of it hearing at that time than I have in years past. And so, yeah, just like Jake said, this week, start looking at that. See where you're at in that story and where, uh, where God wants to meet you and all that. So, 
Don't forget to invite your friends for Easter uh, coming up, your friends and your family. Make sure to uh, let them know, and we'll get some cards out in the next couple weeks that you can give to people. We've got the digital version on social media and on the YouTube, uh, sorry, on the version Bible app. Um, and we would love to partner with you. If you'd love to partner with us uh, financially, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can go to newhopechristian.org and go to the giving tab. We also have some giving boxes back here in the back, and it just helps us in how we're making a, a difference here in our community and around the world. We love you guys. Let's see you next Sunday. Goodbye.